So Will strongly objected on obvious grounds. All right? You can certainly understand where that one's going. So what happened then? Well, <laughs> because we do not live in a Disney world, Tite brought charges against him in the world of the university. He claimed that he was a disruptive influence, and he was ultimately dismissed by the university. Well, wait a minute. That's not supposed to happen, is it? No, it's not supposed to happen, but it does happen, right? Who was right in this case? Well, Will was. There's absolutely no way you could possibly build you know, uh, an office space without the basics of public safety, right? So there was no question that he did the right thing. And no, Tite should not have you know, said that he was you know, disruptive and should not have gotten him fired, right? This is a challenging situation. The real question is, did they end up building the office space and did it have the appropriate safety measures? If they didn't, then Will still has an obligation. He still needs to do something to make sure that the proper basic safety measures are applied to that workspace, right? <laughs> Bad news about this ethical stuff. It doesn't end, your obligation, your responsibility does not end when you become fired. If the situation still exists, you still have a responsibility. All right, another case study. Intensive care, okay? George Ames went to work for a hospital computer department. Hey, another good jig, okay? Now, this particular group was working on an interface between a piece of uh, commercial data processing software, basically put a lot of data into it, it can crunch numbers and stuff like that, and the hospital's ICU. As we all know, ICU is the intensive care unit. It's where the people who are needing the most desperate care are put. And you can clearly understand that with all the machines and all the monitoring that they have in ICU, it probably produces a great deal of information that goes into this crunching piece of software. Okay? What George discovered very, very quickly was from the manager down, this particular computer group was not technically capable. And you know, how many times has this happened to us? Right? We've bumped into a group, an individual, or a group within our organization who really doesn't have what it takes to accomplish the job that they've been assigned to do. Okay? George learned that this incompetent group was, was way behind, first off. That's the huge part, because they weren't that good at what they did. But then he found out that they were seriously considering cutting back on testing in order to be able to catch up on their schedule. Okay, so George spoke up. He said, stop. <laughs> the one thing you don't want to do with software is not test it. You know, two bad things can happen. First off, you can get garbage as an output, which we all look at and go, whoa, obviously you didn't do a good job. But a far worse thing that can happen is you can get output that looks fantastic, but which is garbage. And there's a good chance that nobody's ever going to detect it. Okay? Now remember, they were trying to hook into the ICU, the most critical part of a hospital. Right? And they were going to take data from that, process it, and they were going to have results come out of that. And the results coming out of that was going to be used to make decisions about how to run the hospital. You really don't want to screw that up. When George spoke up, he was given a very clear impression that he had pretty much screwed the pooch. He had shot himself in the foot. He was no longer a welcome member of that particular team. Now, this situation, which was complicated to begin with, gets even more complicated. It turns out that this software organization was being managed by a very important physician who worked at the hospital. And you didn't, <laughs> you didn't call his baby ugly. And that's exactly what George had just done. After about six months or so, George ended up resigning. He was not going to be able to accomplish anything at this job. All right, so once again, we have a situation, an ethical decision shows up, somebody speaks up, and they end up losing their job effectively, right? Was that the right way to handle this? Hmm. It was a way to handle it, I'll grant you that. But you know, George left, and this incompetent team is still there, still failing, and still probably cutting back on their testing. So I would say that George didn't really do what he was supposed to do. George should have detected the problem, and then he should have worked to get more testing done. He should not have shot himself in the foot. A lot of different ways to get them to extend the testing. Most importantly, they were going to deliver this software to somebody, somebody in the hospital. Somebody was going to accept it. George could have gone to them. He could have said, hey, listen, when you're doing your testing, here's some good stuff to test. 
just to make sure that the software worked correctly. You know, they may have cut back on their testing, but if it was failing the testing, the customer's not going to accept it. He could have solved the problem that way. Probably a lot of other ways to solve it. Getting fired or qu having to quit your job, probably not the best overall solution. So let's talk about computer wafers. You know those big shiny things that they make chips on. Don Fisher was an electrical engineer, and he worked for a company called Dicers. Okay, now this company basically purchased wafers that had been manufactured with the chips on them. Okay? And they would purchase those, then they'd cut the chips out, and they'd actually go ahead and make the actual physical chips. They'd package them up, and then they'd sell them. All right, that sounds pretty good. Okay? Don's job was to test the chips. Every time you make a wafer, it doesn't actually work out correctly. Sometimes there's flaws. So his job was to test the wafers and verify that the chips on them operated correctly. OK. Once again, a very acceptable, very run-of-the-mill engineering job. Nothing spectacular about that. Nothing exciting until the day that Don's manager came to him and instructed him to change his testing procedure. What the manager wanted to have happen was he wanted Don to have more wafers fail. Now, the reason that he wanted to do that was because then they could go back and they could renegotiate the purchase price with the company that's actually supplying the wafers to them, saying, listen, you're sending us a bunch of lousy wafers, you've got to lower your prices, da 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 Don said, no. <laughs> he said, this is working just fine. I've got no problems with this. The company said, fine. Don, we respect you. You seem to have very high moral values. We're all good with that. By the way, you're fired. OK, once again, where is that Disney world that we all want to live in? Look, so Don was told to do something. He had objections to it, and he ends up getting fired. Ugh. Well, that doesn't seem good, does it? No. Well, OK, let's back it up a little bit. So he was approached by one manager asking him to do something squirrely. Is that just the manager saying that? Or is this really a company policy? Where's this coming from? Don never took the time to find out. Okay? Sure, the manager could ask him to do it. Sure, Don could agree, it, and Don could just ignore it. Right? We've probably all done that before, right? Okay. Or, you know, a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Now, Don objected, and he got fired. It seems like that wasn't necessarily the right way to do it. It's not clear that there's a public safety issue here. There's not clear that anybody's being you know, um, harmed by this. It seems to be just sort of an economic thing. But clearly, it didn't work out for the best. Don had a lot of choices, a lot of decisions. As engineers, we always have a lot of decisions. There are different things he could have done in this situation. Here's another interesting story for you. It has to do with, interestingly enough, airbags, which have been in the news a great deal lately. So SalesComp is a company that, among other things, designs and makes sensing devices to be used in the automatic airbag. So they don't actually make the whole airbag, but they do make a critical component of it. Okay? Bob Baines was hired to work in the quality control department, as if you've read papers lately, it's a critical part of anybody who's doing anything with airbags. Okay? About six weeks after starting work, he was asked to sign off on a design that literally he didn't really know anything about. Hey, Don, just go ahead and sign this, would you? He was like, uh, no. So Bob told his manager, hey, he said, wait. He said, look, you're asking me to sign off on this, you know, this technology, this terminology, this situation, this testing method. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't know it. So I'll tell you what, just get somebody who knows about it to sign off on it. Make it so it's not me. Okay? I'm not familiar with safe comps procedures. Okay? His manager said, no. His manager said, Bob, sign off on the new procedure. Okay? Uh, eventually, Bob decided that no, he didn't want to violate his principles by doing something that he thought was wrong, and he also didn't want to be involved in a battle with his manager, and so he resigned. Thank you. Stepped away. Okay. Another tricky call here, right? So he's being asked to sign off on something that he doesn't fully understand. Okay, and no problems with him objecting and stuff like that. There's an interesting question. So Bob didn't understand the procedure. Okay. Does that really matter that much? It probably does matter. Should it prevent him from signing off on it? I'm not convinced that it should. He should learn what the procedure is. 
No question about that whatsoever. He should determine if there's an issue there. No problems with that. Is this enough for him to go, whoa, I've got an a, a ethical issue here. I need to resign? I'm not convinced that it is. There was a lot of different ways he could have handled this one. He chose one particular path. There's no question about that whatsoever. But if you and I were in that same situation, you know, I'm not sure if we'd take the same path. You know, the job's valuable to us. We really don't want to have to leave. We don't want to have to resign and stuff like that. You know, could we sign off on it, then learn what it is, and then go back if there's, we have any objections with it? Yeah. Really, Bob's issue was his own knowledge. Okay? Not a problem. You know, I certainly don't claim that I know everything, and I suspect you wouldn't claim that you know everything. If we're in a situation where we encounter something that we don't know about it, a lot of different ways to do it. In fact, Bob probably could have gone to his boss and said, listen, boss, you who are my superior, you who perhaps had my job before I had, I don't understand portions of this. Could you explain it to me? Seems reasonable. I've done that to my bosses many times. And they explain it to me. I understand it. And then I'd have no problem signing off on it. Bob chose one solution to this situation. I'm not so sure that I would have chosen the same one. Because look, somebody else got put into his position. What do you think that person did? Did they sign off on it? Probably if they understood what was going on. Probably would have been no big deal whatsoever. Ah, testing. OK, so this is an interesting situation. So a gentleman who was very, very familiar with the way that the military tests and certifies equipment that they're purchasing got a job at a manufacturer of that type of equipment. Not a problem whatsoever. So he's working at his job, and he takes a look at one of the testing procedures that they're doing. And he realizes they're not doing the testing procedure that they had contractually agreed to do. All right. Whoop. Red flag. Ethical issue. Stop. This one gets just a little bit trickier than that one. It turns out they were doing a different test. That test tested exactly the same thing that contractually they said they would do, except the test they were doing was quicker, better, and faster. So he goes to his boss and he says, boss, we have a problem. The boss says, great, what's the problem? He said, we contractually agreed to do this test. But apparently, we're not doing this test. we got to change. His boss says, oh, OK, well, that's a good point. Let me, let me look into it. Okay. Time passes. They don't do anything. He goes back. He says, boss, what's up with this? His boss says, you know, I'm not really willing to go to the customer and tell them that we're not doing that. He said, look, we're delivering a high quality product. Look, we're testing the functionality that we agreed to test, and so it's not failing or causing any problems like that. If I went to the customer and told them that I was not doing the test that I contractually said that I was doing, they would realize I had never been doing that test. And then we'd be in big trouble. Hmm. So what should the company have done? It's a good question. That's a tricky one. I mean, they were actually arguably delivering a better product because the test they were doing was better. You're welcome to the world of government contracting, right? What they contracted for was really relevant five years ago, but we're here now, right? So the company was doing better things for them, but they weren't doing it according to the letter of the law. Uh, this is where we get into that tricky question of, hey, I'm going to do it by the law, right? Not a problem with that whatsoever. The problem is, in this case, potentially the law was out of date. And if they had followed it, they would have had no problems. But also, the fact that they're not following it really shouldn't cause any problems either. Granted. Not a problem with that. One more question for you here. All right, so a city was planning on adding a water tank to their water system. Happens all the time, not a problem whatsoever. So they bought a used water tank. Excellent, not a problem whatsoever. So they went to an outside contractor, a licensed professional engineer, and they asked him, hey, could you test out what our design is for this? He said, not a problem whatsoever. So he took a look at the design. He, he figured out how it was going to be working and stuff like that. And he said, by the way, guys, you really need to do some additional testing to make sure that this is, is going to work out for you. And I'm a little concerned because we're talking about big stuff potentially placed in residential areas. If it failed, things could fall, things could roll, people could be injured. OK? We have you know, guidance from an outside contractor telling us that we need to do some testing. So the city then went and had a talk with the state. The state said, well, you know, that outside testing, you know, the additional testing would be a good idea. But the state 
did not require that the testing get done. And so the city said, hey, <laughs> we're off the hook. We don't have to pay for the additional testing. And they decided to not do it. Mm. As that outside contractor, where does that put you? You believe in your professional heart of hearts. They really should do that testing. But, you know, the people who should be backing you up, the state regulatory board, has said, yeah, you should do it, but you don't have to. Hmm. That's a tricky one. You know, in this situation, I would almost start to think that maybe I was off base. I mean, because I've gone to yet another set of outsiders. They've looked at exactly the same information that I have, and they've reached a separate conclusion. Testing is good. Testing is always good. I don't think there's any question about that. But in this particular case, testing's not required. Which you would think would mean, from their point of view, that if there was a failure, it wasn't going to be catastrophic. Gotcha. A lot of different ways to proceed in this particular situation. I think probably what I would do is I would go back to the state people who did not make it a requirement for the testing to be done. I'd sit down and have a talk with them. Clearly, I think that there's a problem that could come out and cause a lot of problems for us. Clearly, they don't see it the same way. I would like to understand how they see it and how I see it and see if, there was, if we're just out of line, if we're evaluating some conditions differently, or if we're really saying the same sort of thing. A lot of different ways to handle this type of real-world situation. Got it, one more for you here. So there is a company called Tight Screen Company, and they manufacture a tank that's purchased by an outside vendor. So they don't actually make the tank. They take it in, they modify it, and they sell it. Okay? Now, there's no safety valves or any other protective features on the tank that the company is buying. Okay? One of their engineers, Ralph Kerr, learned that the tanks were not pressure rated by the company that they were buying it from. The company never agreed to do it. They never sold it as being pressure tested. They just delivered the tanks. Okay? However, the folks at Tight Screen Company were selling a product that had a sticker on it that said that it was good up to a certain pressure rating. Uh oh. Now we got ourselves a problem. So our engineer, Frank Kerr, pointed out this to the management. Hey, look, we're putting a sticker on here that says that this tank is good up until this particular pressure rating, but guess what? The people that we're buying it from have never done any testing whatsoever. Management said, as management always says, thank you so much for pointing that out to us. We greatly appreciate that. We'll certainly do something about it. And then they proceeded to very promptly do absolutely nothing. Gotcha. So about this time, Kier left. He quit his job. He went to work for another company in the field. Rock and roll. See, it happens all the time. Engineers move from job to job. However, <laughs> that doesn't release him from his ethical obligations, right? He's wondering what he needs to do about tight screen continuing to crank out a product that has a sticker on it that says, eh, don't worry about it. You can go ahead and use this tank up to this pressure with no problems. Well, you know, maybe you can. There's no question about it. Maybe that tank actually operates up to like twice that pressure with no problems. But here's the thing, you don't know, do you? So it's entirely possible somebody could buy the tank, take it home, crank it up to whatever pressure. It could have a blowout, turn into a missile, and cause all sorts of problems, right? Ah. You know, and this is one of the challenges that we really do face as engineers. You know, when we're on a job and we encounter an ethical situation, we really own that ethical decision. We own that ethical situation at that particular point in time. I mean, we might get fired, we might quit, we might switch to a new position in that company, but that doesn't really release us from the obligations that we have to resolve the issue that we discovered. So in terms of the tank, it's a huge issue. You don't want anybody getting hurt because they overpressurized a tank because they believe the stickers that were on the tank. Hmm. So just because you quit and move on to another job 
doesn't take you out of that situation. So what could you possibly do in this situation? Well, basically, you've got a labeling issue, right? Now, good news, <laughs> there's state regulators and stuff like that that you know, worry about this exact type of thing. I also think, <laughs> at least in my knowledge, scuba tanks, interestingly enough, are regulated by the um, Department of Transportation. Because if you punch a hole in them, guess what? <laughs> They're most definitely a vehicle that's on the move. So I'm sure that he could look into it and discover who regulates pressurized tanks. He could probably contact them and say, listen, there's a product on the market that's really uh, certified, but it's not really certified. You need to at least take a look into it. Seems like that would sort of maybe complete his ethical obligation to all of the people who've purchased this particular product. Okay? And in all honesty, he did give his employer a chance to make the changes to it. It seems like he's sort of, as long as he doesn't drop the ball here, as long as he doesn't think that by switching jobs, switching companies that he's working for, that he's got himself out of the, uh, out of the situation where he has to make a decision, then he's actually probably on pretty good grounds.